O Saviour of the world, who by your cross and precious blood have redeemed us. Save us and help us, we come to seek you to the Almighty God, look with mercy on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our disease, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. 
Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offering and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hear the word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. 
but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. 
Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was about to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfil the word that he had spoken, I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing round it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? If this man were not not a criminal, criminal, he would would not not hand hand him over to you. Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. We are not permitted to put anyone. This was to fulfil what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are a king. 
you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. Away, away, crucify. Shall I crucify your king? We have no. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. And then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. 
A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled, none of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation, the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the passion of the Lord. Praise be to thee, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Coming to church on Good Friday is not for everyone. Just like some people can't go to funerals. The story of Christ's final moments before his death I find confronting. I'm sure you do too. Though we may have heard the reading of the Passion many times before, we are still affected by its impact. So I congratulate you for being here. I congratulate you for thinking that the only place to be on this day is with the family of Christians watching, praying at the foot of the cross. Because it is not easy to be here, notwithstanding COVID and restrictions. We choose to come we choose to be confronted with difficult things about death, about our humanity, our mortality, about ourselves. We come face to face with difficult truths about our capacity as human beings to inflict great suffering, to reject God's teaching and will, our capacity to kill the Son of God. And yes, it is we who killed him, we as in humans, our fellow human beings, people like us, individuals like us, communities like ours, politicians and religious leaders like ourselves, failed the Messiah. And every year on Good Friday, we come ready to face the music, as it were, to face the reality of our culpability and our guilt. And each year on Good Friday, we hear the Passion story from John's Gospel. But before I go on, we must understand something important about 
how John's Gospel tells of Jesus' death. In the Gospel, the evangelist, evangelist repeatedly uses the term the Jews in speaking of the enemies of Jesus. And quite rightly, this term has been called into question because we live this side of the Holocaust. Often what John means by the Jews is the religious authorities, people like me. And while the Romans crucified Jesus, not the Jews, more importantly, in John's Gospel, Jesus is a universal figure who dies for the whole world, for the whole of humanity. In the same way, the Jews are also universal. They represent all of us, for it was human pride and sinfulness that crucified Jesus, and who here today can claim they are without sinful pride or thoughts? This important theological idea is expressed in the dramatic way in which we read the Passion today. We cry out, crucify him. It's confronting. It's meant to be. We identify with our shared human capacity to want to reject and kill love. And we are all pilots, because human politics was always going to mean Rome would never tolerate dissension. We are all the Jews, we are all pilots, and we are all Peters. Individuals who in small or large ways betray our Lord, behave hypocritically, despite our best efforts not to. This is the truth of the human condition. It's truth and it's glory. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, says St. Paul. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And that is why we are here. There is another of the reasons why it's not easy to be here facing the truth of our flawed humanity, our mortal and limited humanity. We are not perfect because we, and we God-botherers, have a word for that. It's called sin. It is sin that crucifies Jesus. Sin means separated from God. It was human beings falling short of who they were created to be that crucifies Jesus. So the importance of your presence here today is because you have recognised the uniqueness of the story we've just heard. Other religions view Jesus quite differently and many people view Jesus as a good man who died unjustly, end of story. But you are here this morning because of what is unique about Jesus' death. And Jesus was not just another victim of Rome's domination of Palestine, his death was not just another act of state-sponsored execution. This was not just another good man killed for the sake of expediency. This was the unique Christ, whom we know as Saviour and Lord. This was the promised Messiah, who suffered and died for our sins. And your presence here today sends a message to our community and to the world that this was not just another death, as tragic as it was, it was a gruesome end, and we know Jesus knew it would not be easy, which is why he asked in the garden the night before if it had to be this way. But it is not how much Jesus suffered that makes the difference. After all, there are so many other people who've suffered more and for longer. That Jesus suffered is important, but not how long or how difficult it was. It is precisely who this Jesus is that makes such an impact on our world. It's the Son of God crucified. Not the death of a political agitator. No, this death is no less than the death of the second person of the Holy Trinity. A death allowed by God the Father who lets humanity pour out its anger and rejection on the Son. And through the work of the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, already at work in those who witnessed that first act of injustice, will transform this crucifixion into a profound act of our redemption. 
God transforms our acts of hatred into God's act of profound love through the work of the Holy Spirit. And in so doing, God reveals God's true nature. A God who deeply understands our suffering and our human plight, and that plight is sin. Jesus dies for our sins. And this is not just our little failings from time to time. This is the basic problem we all live with. Our capacity as human beings to do terrible things from a deep fear that we are not loved or valued. Which leads us to desperately hurt and diminish others to help us feel superior. We see it in our world today, in the Ukraine. A few days ago, former Archbishop of Canterbury, Brian Williams, joined other faith leaders on a visit to Ukraine. What possible use would a bunch of clerics and religious leaders be to them? Well, just like we came today, they went there. In the city of Chernivsta, Lord Williams spoke of why they had come. Our hope, then, is just to stand alongside you, to let you know you are not forgotten, and to hear from you, and to receive life and hope from you. Our Christian scriptures say that if one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. What makes you suffer, what threatens your life, threatens the lives of the whole human family. And if it is true, the least we can do is to be here, to sit with you, even if only for this short time. For us, it is a way of saying to the various countries and contexts we come from, it is our life and hope too that is at stake in the agony that this country is enduring. No cheap comfort. But we are here because we recognise that we cannot be free, we cannot even be human, if you are not treated free and you are not treated as human. The people of Ukraine have metaphorically been crucified. And so they are very much in our thoughts this day, as well as Myanmar or Yemen or other places of violence and oppression. But Archbishop Rowan went on to say, faith above all is the trustful knowledge that our lives, all of them, are precious. War is a terrible assault on this knowledge because war is a process in which lives are sacrificed in cruel, arbitrary ways, especially in the indiscriminate terror of modern methods of war, as we've seen so dramatically and horrifically these last weeks. And the faith and hope we want to witness to, along with you, is a trust that the strong and fearless commitment to freedom and dignity, which the people of Ukraine have shown, will be a sign of hope worldwide, even one day a sign of hope to those who have been enemies and aggressors when they begin to wake up to the terrible nature of what they have done. The war in Ukraine is the outflow of sin, human pride and even fear resulting in the innocent suffering and dying. Come here today to recognise that Christ dies on the cross to end this fear, to forgive this sin, to welcome us all into the community of God. And though people are dying on the battlefield and starving in cities, the real battle is played within the human heart. If Jesus were a superhero, his secret weapon would be love. Thank you for being here today and witnessing to this love. I hope you might take this opportunity to come again to the cross of Christ, to lay your burdens down, to remember the people of the world suffering, to allow the love of Christ to enter your heart, to give thanks that it is a love that is stronger than death. In Christ's name, amen.
on which was hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship Behold the wood of the cross on which was hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us Behold the wood of the cross on which was hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us Jesus Christ, who on the day of your passion stretch out your arms upon the hard wood of the cross, that all people might be brought within their saving embrace, draw us to yourself with the bands of your love, and grant that evermore being bound to you as your faithful servants, we may take up our cross daily and follow you who live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Therefore we pray to our Heavenly Father for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Church of God throughout the world, for unity in faith, in witness and in service, for bishops and other ministers and those whom they serve, for Kay, our Archbishop, and for Jeremy and Kate, our bishops, and the people of this diocese, for all Christians dispersed and under lockdown, united in prayer during these holy days, for those who are mocked and persecuted for their faith, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, Hear our prayer which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth to the glory of your name. Through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for the nations of the world and their leaders, for Elizabeth our Queen and the parliaments of this land, for those who administer the law, and all who serve in public office, for health authorities during this time of pandemic disease, and all medical professionals, for all who strive for justice and reconciliation, that by God's help, the world may live in peace and freedom. Most gracious God and Father, in whose will is our peace, Turn our hearts and the hearts of all to yourself, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, the peace which is founded on justice may be established throughout the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for God's ancient people, the Jews, the first to hear his word, for greater understanding between Christian and Jew, for the removal of our blindness and bitterness of heart, that God will grant us grace to be faithful to his covenant and to grow in the love of his name. Lord God of Abraham, bless the children of your covenant, both Jew and Christian. Take from us all blindness and bitterness of heart and hasten the coming of your kingdom, when the Gentiles shall be gathered in, all Israel shall be saved, and we shall dwell together in mutual love and peace under the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe the gospel of Christ, for those who have not heard the message of salvation, for all who have lost faith for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of Christ and persecute those who follow him, for all who deny the faith of Christ crucified, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the people of the earth, have compassion on all who do not know you, and by the preaching of your gospel with grace and power, gather them into the one fold of the one shepherd, Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer, for those who are deprived and oppressed, for all who are sick, for those in darkness, in doubt, and in despair, in loneliness, and in fear, for prisoners, captives, and refugees, for the victims of false accusations and violence, for all at the point of death, and those who watch beside them, 
that God in his mercy will sustain them with the knowledge of his love. Almighty and everlasting God, the comfort of the sad, the strength of those who suffer, hear the prayers of your children who cry out of any trouble, and to every distressed soul grant mercy, relief, and refreshment through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's, let us commend ourselves and all God's children to his unfailing love and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have died in the peace of Christ, we may come to the fullness of eternal life and the joy of the resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favourably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred, sacred mystery, and by the tranquil operation of your perpetual providence, carry out the work of our salvation. Let the whole world feel and see that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are returning to perfection through him from whom they took their origin, even Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Almighty and most merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ.
standing at the foot of the cross, we are confident to pray as our Saviour taught. Our Father in heaven. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, set your passion, cross and death between your judgment and us, now and at the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, rest to the faithful departed, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, eternal life and glory. For you are alive and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.